People who went to Albany would have seen by themselves and some of the issues that we deal with, with uh, having such a diverse and wonderful flora. Many of you, I'm sure in Eastern Australia, would know the mountain bells, the wonderful Darwinias that we have in Western Australia that are pretty well entirely confined to the Stirling Range. Um, and they are quite localised. It used to be thought that they were basically confined to single peaks. Neville March and myself did a quite a detailed study of the distribution and taxonomy of these um, species. And we found that in fact, they tend to be confined to groups of peaks, depending on rainfall. The rainfall in the eastern side of the range is lowest. It's highest on Bluff Knoll in the Bluff Knoll Plateau. And there we get snow, rarely, about two or three times a year, even up to five centimetres. Um, truly amazing. And it's snowed this year, um, but it's the only part of Western Australia that regularly snows. So the mountain bells are about 10 species that we've actually named them all now. They are, as you can see, really got very confined ranges within the park. You would think that they're pretty safe because they're essentially all within a major national park. You can the boundary, you can see the boundary of the park there. You would think they're pretty safe. Um, and these are some of the natural, they hybridize quite readily, but that's not an issue with them. Um, they are species that are very closely related. And whenever they get together, there's always a band of hybrids, but these hybrids never overwhelm the species, which they may do, you would think if there's a lot of disturbance. So they're wonderful plants. They're horticulturally really significant. They're bird pollinated, they're killed by fire. They come up en masse in very dense populations after a fire. They then flower and seed madly for about seven to 10 years, and they slowly fade out as the um, shrubbery gets too thick and their seeds wait in the soil, their, their fruits actually wait in the soil until the next fire comes along. You would think, what's the problem that they can possibly have? Some of the really major threats to all of the, or not all, but pretty well all of the Stirling Range in Phoenix. Um, the Bluff Knoll Plateau has 13 species of plants confined to it. This is one, Dranda Montana or Banksia Montana, which is now down to about 13 plants on the Bluff Knoll Plateau. It used to be abundant on the plateau when I first went there. The threats in the Stirlings are too frequent a fire, if you will come up from seed and you need seeds to go back in the seed bank, you obviously need the plants to sit around and flower long enough to put the seeds back in the seed bank. So if you have fires in under about 10 to 13 years would seem to be the time, you have some major issues and we've had some major fires in the Stirlings. But the biggest problem is Phytophthora, the dieback disease. That gray area you can see in the bottom left hand side is infected. Um, areas of bushland. And it's a, in, Dryander Montana is incredibly susceptible to it. The Darwinias are field resistant, but they require plants to grow under. They do require some shelter. They are certainly susceptible in pot trials to Phytophthora. And it would seem that the Phytophthora and what it's doing, this is a picture I took in 1970 over the top of Bluff Knoll. You, that was two metres high, you could not walk through it, and I'm not kidding. In there, it includes Dranda Montana's in there, endemic Nanthos, an endemic large big Andersonia, endemic Impacrid, several endemic peas, a whole range of species only known from the Bluff Knoll Plateau. And this is what it looks like now. You can see that here, where in the past, the plants would have been up to the top of that walker that you can see there. There's just sedges. That Phytophthora has gone right through the park in, in the upper parts of the park. This is an endemic um, Lepidosperma. It's doing very nicely. But in fact, the really amazing thicket of vegetation, there's just a few remnants you can spot in places. And the fires are taking these out. 
And when they first come up from seed, these species are the most susceptible, unfortunately. So, and rabbits have now turned up on the plateau because it's open enough for bunnies and they eat the seedlings. They're eating the seedlings as well. So these are the reasons why WA or the Southwest is an internationally recognised IUCN hotspot. It has both the good and the bad. The good and, or the good, the bad and the ugly, I suppose you could say. Um, the good is we have a wonderful, amazing flora. Um, thousands of species, literally thousands known nowhere else in the world. The bad is that it's had an awful lot of clearing and development since European settlement lots of issues of fire and all sorts of consequences. And the really ugly part is this insidious weedy disease that's come in and is devastating parts of our reserves and areas. We spray these areas with a um, fungicide called phosphonate. The problem is, although it works quite well, it seems to be a gene switch for alerting plants that this organism is attacking them. The problem is our plants hate phosphate. So at times, if we've got to do this too often, the cure, the treatment is about as bad as the cure, if you get what I mean. It will have phosphate toxicity occur. So it's nothing's ever easy. Okay, some of the wonderful things about WA getting away from the gloom and the doom is that you may not realize is that our wonderful honey eaters it's given us our flora, which can, which birds are big. They're hungry. They tend to trash flowers if they're a bit nice and um, not very robust. So it's given us a really great range of robust and really brightly colored flowers with perches. Things like Bengtian menziesii, you can see here, many of the grevilleas, this is actually grevillea bromlinae, I'm going to snuck that one in. Um, but we have, and these tend to be hard flowers. They are hard because birds are tough on flowers. They produce brilliant colored flowers that are big because birds are big and birds have the same color vision as we've got. So they like bright contrasting colors with a perch to sit on. These plants produce copious nectar and things like State emblem, the great red and green kangaroo paw, is an exactly beautiful example of a bird pollinated flower. We've got over 800 species of plants in the southwest that are predominantly or entirely pollinated by birds, the biggest in the world. So, another thing for, as to one reason why we've got a pretty swish stuff. We also, for people who like carnivorous plants, we have the richest and most diverse range of carnivorous plants in the world. This is partly because we've also got the worst soil in the world. We no nutrients, low phosphate, no nitrogen. Um, and if you want to get ahead in the world, you basically have to go and get your nitrogen from other sources. So these, this is um, here is the world's biggest drosera, um, drosera gigantea. It's only about 30 centimetres high. And we have a huge range of these little rosetta droseras some of which have been aged also at plus 30 years by their tunics. So we also have very long lived plants that you may not believe. These come up um, annually renewed from a rhizome and they are very long lived plants. Even though they look like they're annuals, they're not. They're generally very long lived plants. So we have this amazing range of carnivorous plants, which make people from all over the world, especially the Japanese, very envious of us. And we also have the world's most wonderful range of trigger plants. Um, there are 150 species of trigger plants in West, Southern Western Australia. They have the most amazing shapes, colors. They're every color under the rainbow. They have an active pollination system where the trigger, as you know, is the fastest moving object in the plant world. It's been timed by plant physiologists. They get probed in the throat, bang over comes this, the um, trigger, hits whatever it is on the back, deposits pollen or picks up pollen. They actually produce the anthers first and then the stigma grows through, so they outbreed. So 150 species of these 
and they're getting named at about the rate of about 10 or more a year. So summing that up, I mean, we've got many, many, many other families I could go through and bore you stupid with, or maybe inspire you, a huge range of acacias, huge range of eucalypts, huge range of Myrtaceae, a whole range of Myrtaceae, the best in the world sort of style. So, but we, the key bit is we have many, many local endemics, six and a half thousand currently counted. Species richness, which is a feature of Mediterranean ecosystems, is very high throughout the entire Southwest. And we've done quadrats, equal size quadrats right throughout the Southwest. And I can tell you, like, for example, our bench of woodlands vary from about 30 species per 100 square metres up to 100. And the Congan heathlands go from the same, 60 up to 110 species. So very, very species rich communities, unlike anything in the Northern Hemisphere. What did you have to do with that? Funny, okay. The location of this highest diversity varies greatly within groups. So this makes it really interesting in the fact that the northern sand plains are the headquarters for um, example the bank the banks of groups the wheat belts are head for acacias so whichever group you look at and the daisies again are the northern areas of the wheat belt so we've got really different patterns depending on where you are in the southwest so whatever group you're interested in may well be highly diverse within an area that we haven't got a reserve or haven't got proper reserves yet. The other thing I want to really finish with in some ways is to tell you that our flora is really still very poorly known. We have an incredible amount to learn. We're only just un un unhinging the fact that our marvellous um, baronias, which you probably know Baronia megastigma, that beautifully centered baronias, each have their own sort of moth to pollinate them. Unique moths, almost entirely unnamed, which lay their eggs in the big stigmas that these baronias have. The caterpillars develop in them and they fly away. They've got, and we've got about 20 species of these. And we knew virtually nothing about these until some people started looking at the moths. We name about 50 to 100 new species a year, and the current estimates are we'll be doing this for another 20 to 50 years. So there's an enormous amount still to learn. And just one example of this, I know you have hovias over there in East. Um, we have a very common species called Hovia trisperma. However, Hovia trisperma, like many of the groups, many species in WA, which have been recently revised and revised quite well on herbarium material, contains about six different species. And they are a group I've worked on. This is Hovia trisperma var grandiflora, which is only known on the coastal plain here. It's got flowers twice the size of normal trisperma trisperma. We have since found out that this is not Hovia trisperma trisperma, it's actually Hovia trisperma, strictly speaking, only occurs in Jarrah Forest down around Albany um, and is a little post fire species. This one has a name, but it just gives you an idea that we've got an enormous amount still to learn. And we, in some ways, these get, because they're widespread, they are considered not to have any threats. But in fact, for many of our species, this is not true. And this is one classic example of it. For those of you who love orchids, you probably know that our donkey orchids um, uh, be, mimic the flowers of Bossia, Bossia area carpa. The bees that come to peas, bee, bee flower, pea flowers are designed for bees. If you look at this under a scanning EM, that's so uh, you notice there's a bit there, it tells the bee to go in there. This yellow comes out white to a bee that can see an ultraviolet. That comes out as white, that comes out as black, and the beacon has got here, just done in the bit below that white part, the yellow eye, there are grooves that the bee's feet fit into. And so they can shove it down like you can see Mrs. B there doing to a divisia. Really um, unbelievable. But the really unbelievable part is that the diuruses have uh, bee mimics, are pea mimics, and they're mimicking Bossy area carpet. 
there are about, I think the orchidologists have split off about seven species of um, diuris, and we're pretty sure there's also about seven to 10 species within Bosteria carpa. We just don't know. So this is one from Mount Lasua that's com a completely new Bossier, and there's a, not surprisingly, there's a diuris that will match it. And this is the one from round Perth, which is true area carpa. So the thing that I want to really leave you with is we have in Western Australia, an absolutely amazing flora. It ought to be much better known internationally. It's a pity we just can't seem to sell it as well as we can sell our animals, but maybe one of the ways we can sell it is by pointing out that without the bossiers, you wouldn't have the bees to do the diuris and you wouldn't have the bees if you didn't have the bossiers to do the diuris. So it's a wonderfully complex flora. I've had the absolute amazing pleasure of being able to work on it for my life. And I would say that I, if I just had another five lifetimes, I might actually finish doing work on it. And just to thanks, this just to remind you, this is where we were in Albany. So this is Albany, for those of you who don't know Western Australia. This is one of the best harbours in the world. It was first sailed into by Vancouver, visited by Robert Flinders, who had Robert Brown, the really amazing botanist on it. He named two and a bit over two and a half thousand Australian plants in his Prodromus. And he's the most amazing botanist I could ever think of. And he walked all over the Albany area and in 1826, the first settlement in Western Australia was carried out in Albany. And in fact, the first farm was on this little island that you can, the little dot in the, the harbour that you can see there. That was where they put, they dropped one of the convicts on there and told him to grow vegetables because it was full of guano because they couldn't grow veggies anywhere else because the soils were so poor. So if you came to Western Australia to go to Ants Park, Albany is one of the key botanical places in Western Australia for the Southwest, the study of it. And fortunately, it's surrounded by very lovely national parks, which keep the flora. And that's me. Okay, now what do I do? You there? Uh, yes, if you go to share screen, you should be able to yep. unmute there. Yep. And that'll put you back. Oh, there we are. And I'll just turn that off and it should be, there we go. That's it, uh, yep. all done, okay. So thank you for that, Greg. One, th one thing I forgot to do was to actually introduce you properly. So <laughs> a little bit late in the day, but I might do it anyway. And I'm reading from the, um, the, uh, the conference handbook from the, um, the conference we went to. And the biography for uh, Greg says, with over 500 publications to his credit, including the field guide to weeds of WA, Greg is one of the best known and most respected botanists in Australia. He retired as senior principal research scientist in DBCA. As a botanist in the biological survey group, he has participated in preparing regional conservation plans arising from wildlife surveys of most of Western Australia. Greg has named over 60 new species, and seven species are named for Greg, uh, and Bromwin by the sound of it. He has collected more than 30,000 plant specimens, the largest ever collection by an individual in WA. Greg has been a member of the Wildflower Society of WA since the 1970s, and was the inaugural president of the Perth branch. He has worked with the Society Bushland Plant Survey Program for more than 25 years. Over more than 40 years, he has presented at hundreds of scientific and public meetings and taken groups of local, national and international people to see the wildflowers. Greg has an Australian Plants Award Medal. So that was Greg. Sorry, Greg, that we didn't do that. That's <laughs> fine. 